Shall we kick it off? Absolutely. Welcome, everyone. Woo. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, thank you for everything you do to support Incinor. It's great to see everybody back. It's exciting to see live production. We're really excited for the fall. Um, one housekeeping item, please mark your calendars for Thursday, September 9th. We're going to do kind of a behind-the-scenes preview of Twitch, 5.30 to 7 on the Incinor Garden. And Kayla might will elaborate a little bit more on that. So I will introduce her. Uh, Kayla Lowen is our artistic director for Dior. She got her bachelor's degree in international politics at Georgetown and an NFA from Northwestern. And we are really excited to have her. Hey, and then I will introduce, hello everyone. And then I am going to introduce Jen who is our special guest artist today. Jen is waving, hello. Um, and um, Jen, Jennifer Folk is a Chinese American lighting designer based in New York City. Her design collaborations center around reimagining classics, exploring new work and collaborating with interdisciplinary arts in movement, dance and music. She is interested in telling stories that explore and question the vulnerability of the human condition and pushes us to examine the unconformable aspects of our shared humanity. She received her BFA in theater production and design from Ithaca College. She has a list of theaters that she's collaborated with that is too long to mention here, but um, includes Long Wharf Theater, Lincoln Center Education, Flint Repertory Theater, Portland Stage, um, Arts Nova, Theater at Monmouth, Company One in Boston, and soon for the first time, Theater Works Colorado Springs, as Jen will be coming out in September to serve as our lighting designer for Witch by Jen Silverman. So, so excited to make my Theater Works debut. <laughs> Yes, we, and I've never been to Colorado, so that's that's double exciting. I didn't know that you would be getting to like check a state off of your list. It's, yeah, your checking, time with checking the state off. I think it's like number twenty three now out of the, wow. out, of the out of the fifty. So we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe we'll come back to that later because I have a question. I'm always curious about the sort of freelance yeah. designer yeah. lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means with the travel. Um, so just, uh, I have some questions that I want to ask, uh, Jen, we're, uh, we'll of course save time at the end for if other folks have questions or you can drop them in the chat. Hello, everyone. I will say hello, everyone in the chat. So we make sure we have it here and can see it. And then of course we're a small enough group. So if you, if something that Jen or I say sparks a burning question in you as we go along, I think you can of course feel free to, you know, send up a hand and we can um, integrate the question in the moment. But I'm really excited to talk about um, about lighting design, which is one of, I find it even as a person of the theater to be one of those um, ineffable, uh, the ineffable and mysterious uh, design design elements because it's so, time-based and not as physical as other elements where you're literally building a table. So Jen, I'm going to start with a question that I always start with in these sessions, which is just, I'm curious about your origin story as an artist. How did you come to be a person of the theater? Um, by accident, actually. Um, you know, in high school, um, you know, you're always like asked to do like some sort of elective. And um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I was like, maybe I'll do like drawing class or maybe I'll do um, like stagecraft or you know I didn't really know what to do and I actually got placed in acting like the acting one class by like mistake <laughs> um, and so I kind of like told the teacher like begged the teacher like don't make me go on stage and like recite a monologue is there anything else I can do and I guess the teacher saw something in me or in my in my fright um, and was like you should like you know uh work backstage and like work with props and like work with scenery and work with you know you know sound and so that kind of like launched me into um that whole world um and then they and she was like you should come volunteer like after school and like hang lights and like as soon as I started doing that um like I was kind of like hooked from that point forward so by accident may I ask I'm curious what hooked you about lights 
Uh, I always had seen thing, like seeing live performances. And I think when I started high school and I started actually like working backstage and like getting my hands dirty, understanding like equipment, then I was able to like see like shows and understand like, oh, wow, like lighting is actually creating the emotional response that I'm having. Mm -hmm. And it's actually telling me where to look and like where we are. Uh, and I just, I, I remember like sitting in the theater watching a production of Swan Lake and just being mesmerized by how like side lighting in dance can like make performers like essentially feel like they're floating in air. Mm -hmm. And that was all the lighting doing, that was just all the lighting and the color and the, the timing and the music and like all those things like wrapped together was just so inspirational. Um, and I, I, I just felt like I had to do, do lighting. So I just kind of jumped into it. I love that. And I love that also it, you mentioning Swan Lake also highlights, even though most of my questions are going to be about theater, because that's what I know about, mm -hmm. that you are an artist who works in lighting design in an interdisciplinary way. And so in, in, in visual art installation and, and a lot of collaboration with dance. So you have all those influences going on. Yeah, it's really exciting. The, the, like the exciting thing about lighting is that it's in everything, right? It's not just in theater, it's in, it's in painting, photography, animation. I mean, we encounter light every day, um, whether we're aware of it or not, but um, it's, it's really interesting. Like each of our Zoom windows has a different kind of storytelling lighting quality to it, right? Mm -hmm. so that's really exciting. Oh. So will you walk us through a design process? I'm especially interested, um, like from the very beginning, like what do you do with the text before you even meet with a director? What is a design process? How does it start for you? Oh yeah, I can start from like the very beginning. Yeah, um, the very it, beginning. So like, these are all kind of like truncated just because of time. But the, the first thing is like just getting the job, like getting a phone call, getting an email being like, hey, are you free to do which in Colorado Springs? I'm like, absolutely. Uh, and then the next thing I ask is, okay, can you send me the script? I'll read the script and start to notate like time period, characters, if there's anything in the script that's, that uh, alludes to like time of day. I'm, I'm really building like my first impression of the script uh, if I had not read it before. And so I'm always constantly taking notes and I meet with the director uh, and we talk about like, you know, is this a good fit for like both of us? Like, do we feel like our ideas, we can come together and tell the story? Uh, and if that's true, then, you know, we sign a contract and then we, you know, we go from there. Um, but I'm always looking at um, the text just for clues that the playwright is leaving to, to style, to play period. Um, is this like a realistic play? Is this magical realism? Is there a lot of um, dance elements in this play? Um, so there's a lot of things that you can kind of glean from your first read as well. Um, and then you kind of, you start to kind of integrate all those ideas that you have with the director. And then also when you start to meet the other collaborators of the show, they have their own ideas. Uh, and I always like to say like the best ideas don't have to come from, you know, you know, lighting idea doesn't have to come from the lighting designer. It can come from the director or the set designer or, you know, it can come from anybody. We're all kind of sharing um, the same brain space. So that's really exciting when you get to work with new people. Um, oftentimes I, I find working with people who have a different point of view about the play um, will challenge my point of view of the play and ultimately make the play better. Um, so that's really exciting. That's kind of like the, the initial kind of part of it, like getting the idea of like what the play is, why we're telling this play. So those are the less technical things. <laughs> right, the, the story and not only, yeah. but I, but it sounds like the story and the technical and some of the technical elements might lie, need to lie side by side for you as I'm sure that they do for lots of designers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the initial like parts of the production, um, I'm, you know, I'm always aware of like the technical, like it's the show being done outside, is the show being done in the round, like what's the, like all these kind of um, real world elements you have to take into consideration. But at least I try not to think about those things too early on. Um, at some point in the process, you kind of have to say, okay, well, we can't do like this part of the story where she has to fly. We can't really do that. So like, what's the creative solution? So you kind of start to um, pro like creatively problem solve all the things in the play. And, and that usually comes like a little bit later on. 
So then you meet after you've had those initial ideas and then you started to meet, as you said, the, as you said, the best lighting design ideas can, the best lighting ideas can come from anywhere. So after you have your initial response to the play, then you meet with the director and you meet with the team. And what do you do to then begin to communicate what ideas bubble up from, from those thoughts? Yeah. So usually um, uh, I do uh, like a research process. So I, I get, uh, images from uh, paintings, from photography, from movies, just trying to like communicate the quality of, of light um, that, or like the emotional feeling that this play feels like. Um, and that can be anything. That can be, um, you know, this play takes place in, in a, you know, which takes place in a Jacobean period. So just looking at just different colors and textures. And, you know, in that period, there's like kerosene lamps and trying to figure out you know, where, like, does this society or does this world have electricity? Does this world have, you know, just what are the things in this world and this play that are, in, that are creating light? Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a constant, like, research, you know, process. We go back and forth and sharing images, and those um, spark all kinds of ideas as well. Will you show, do you have research images that you can show us like an example of what that? Yeah, do you want like? some from which or like another, the other process? Uh, I'm torn, Jen, right? Because with which you won't be able to show us, like, of course I want these folks to know about which, but with which you won't be able to show us like how it all comes to fruition in the way that you would with another show. I can show, I can do a little bit of both. Maybe um, a little bit of both, because then with the other show, you'll be able to take us on yeah. the journey of how it then came to be embodied. Yeah, I will uh, I'll walk you through that. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Um, so I'm just going to walk through this. So this is a production of The Chairs by Eugene Ionesco that was done at Flint Repertory Theater. Um, the, I don't know if you know this play, but it's these two, this couple, this older couple who are um, essentially waiting for these invisible guests to arrive. Uh, and it takes place like on an island in the middle of the ocean. But the, the, the um, so there's not really a specific time period or, um, uh, so that's like, how do you light and design the show that doesn't have a specific, specific time period? <laughs> um, but the director was very adamant about the, the inability to escape the past and like, what is the meaning of life? So it's these two characters reaching the end of their life and they're trying to figure out um, how to essentially make, take stock of their life. Um, um, and it's, it's considered a tragic farce. So all these things that like, that are given as a mandate by the director can kind of feed into how we think about the play uh, from a design perspective. Um, so some of this research was, um, one of the things that the director uh, said was like, you know, uh, this is kind of like in the future and it's, it's kind of like society has progressed to a point like where trash and, um, like plastics have overtaken the world, like our world. Like there's more, like the oceans have been filled with plastics and trash. So looking at a lot of like uh, trash and water and like like um, windows with like grime and just also like green rough textures. Um, you can see in one of the images, I don't know if you can see in this image, oh, my pointer's not there. Um, but there's many tones that you can take with green, right? And the idea that a building is like melting or like decomposing. Um, this is some lighting images, just thinking about like light through windows, light through slats, like what is lighting, what does the texture of lighting do when it comes through um, just different buildings. Um, and then again, also looking more at lighting, this idea of like houses on water, like seeing these glows of windows on water. Um, looked at anime, like there's a lot of video game research too, like light, like video games have so much lighting in them. Um, so I'm just looking at video games and then also um, just looking at green plastics. Yeah. Jen, um, something that I'm really interested in, drawing, so you yeah, used yeah. video games or painting, so things that like yeah. have an imagined reality, even though yeah. you are going to create something in a, in a physical reality. Absolutely. Oh. Um, so those are some uh, kind of initial things. And then costumes also like was trying to look at like tattered clothes because, you know, in this society, you know, um, things have kind of, um, um, I'm trying to remember what she said. Um, things are not perfect, right? There's like torn fabrics, things are very gray. Like there's not a lot of color in this world. Um, you know, we also talked about like the idea of like um, um, 
people in society who are homeless, how they have, you know, layers of things and bags and, uh, you know, things are a little bit um, kind of more earthy tone looking. Uh, and then the orator, who's the, um, she, the only other character in the play who doesn't speak, who comes to the play, um, thinking about them as like a, um, like a modern punk rock kind of person. So thinking about like, if this person was like at the club <laughs> and then coming into the, um, the world. So contrasting this very earthy look to something that's more modern. Um, and then like, you know, you go to the theater and you look at the, the space and like, where are the lighting positions? Like where, you know, can you put lights? Um, and then you kind of get like a rendering, right? So like this idea. Jen, the, could you go back for a second yeah, to the where yeah. can you get light? Can, so like, what would you, if you got these pictures, whether you took them or a theater provide them, like what yeah. does this teach you? What, it, what do you know from this? These photos. So from, these are kind of weird images. So the first image <laughs> in the panel is like, is um, uh, the thing I should mention about this production is that we actually put the audience on the back wall of the theater. And we actually decided because the sight lines are so bad in this theater is that all the shows in this theater are actually the audience is on stage and not in the house. So what that told me is like all these lights that were in the house um, that would normally be pointing at the stage you couldn't use. So that's fun. <laughs> so we, what we ended up doing is we actually put lights in the house, like actually into the house shooting at the audience like upstage. Second image is, um, this is upstage. This is like upstage right. Um, there's this staircase that goes up to the grid. So uh, we actually put lights on those staircases. Um, but it really teaches me like where I can put lights because there's only so many physical places you can put lights in a theater. So knowing where the positions are tells me, okay, I can put lights here. I can't put lights here. There's a fire aisle or, you know, there's, you know, there's certain things you can't put. Totally. You used the word grid earlier. Will you just uh, unpack that word for some oh, yeah. of us in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the grid is the uh, it's it's basically a metal ceiling of pipe. So if you think of a building, it has a you know a regular ceiling, but then a grid is like a secondary ceiling where lights can hang and also scenery can hang. So it's if you ever see a show where things are going up and down, um, those are attached to a grid, a, a metal, a ceiling of pipe, essentially. Um, so you can hang lights at those heights. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then at some point you get like a scenic rendering. So this is our scenic rendering of this world of this kind of like island. And, you know, you can see like on the bottom part of the image, there's, you know, trash and all that kind of stuff from the research and the scenic designers like trying to integrate some of this greenery that we saw in the research. Um, this is kind of very technical, but this is what's called a ground plan. So this is like the actual set drawn out so we can build the set. Essentially, we can build this. And this is looking down from the ceiling. Uh, and then I take that and then I actually put lights onto a plot. This is very technical and looks very overwhelming. No, kind of this is great. I feel like I feel like there are some folks on this call who would be very excited to know what all of these bits But this is basically my blueprint. This is my document that I give to, um, I will give to um, a, a person so they can hang the lights. So this tells them where the lights go, um, how I want to control them. So you can see um, where it says old booth, you know, this is on, so this is all on stage. So these are all the lights that are on stage and then there's actually lights further out into the house. Um, so I can give this to a person and they can, you know, hang the lights. Um, this is also just another- Jen, can theory. you go back for a sec? Oh yeah, go ahead. I want to dig, can we dig it? Because you are expert yeah. in this, right? You see these all the time, but most yeah. of us, including me, don't see these things very often. It's so like, <laughs> what are the different kinds of information that's encoded here? So I'm oh, noticing yeah. that they're yeah. like, yeah. I could show the witch version, the witch one too. Sure. The, hold on, can I do this? I don't know if I can. <laughs> it's okay, me. we won't hold you to it. Wow, uh-huh. So this, so see this symbol, this is actually a type of light. Actually, maybe I can pull up the witch one because that might be better. That might be more fun. Oh yeah, here's the, I don't know if you can see this. So this yeah. is the light plot for witch. This is the, uh, the dusty loo. Um, so you'll see, actually I can show you this, sorry. 
no, you're great. This is very so already. Each, this is some next level zooming. Well each, done. Each each. So this is kind of like so each lighting fixture has a symbol. So in the symbol, you can kind of see I've called out like a color, which is the gel, the dimmer, like where it's plugged into, the unit number, and then the channel. The channel is like how I control the light. So if I say I want this blue light upright, I don't have to say that. I can say channel five. And then I know that that's going to be a light that comes on from upright. And then these are all the like the symbols. So these are actually, these symbols actually represent each type of light that's in the show. Because um, there's like so many types of lights that you can put into a show and they all kind of do something different. Um, so I'm just calling out for the person who's going to hang it like, hey, there's this kind of light, there's this kind of light. And then same thing, accessories are just like other types of um, things you can put onto the lights. Um, and then also just some notes. This is like version one that I submitted of the plot. Just some like technical information. And then look, I got I put the, the witch logo. So we know that this is our production. Um, this is my contact information just for people to, you know, in case they need to contact me. And then I usually put all the um, information of the show. So it's, you know, directed by Caitlin Lowens and like just, you know, it's very specific. Um, but if we kind of come over here, you can see that those symbols, I, I've attached a number. So this is unit one on this pipe and this is 21. So this is channel 21 and it's actually hung on pipe 3.2. So they know that I'm going to hang this specific light onto pipe 3.2. I'm going to plug it into number one and then give it channel 21. So when I say 21, I know that it's coming from that position. And you basically do that like 300 more times and then you have a light plot <laughs> for, for which. <laughs> You know the sheer number, and I and, and this isn't even like all of the instruments. I mean, Correct. you have left a few instruments behind, but the sheer number of you know light individual lights that you are that you are thinking about. Yeah, um, and, that, and again, all this kind of comes from conversations you have with the director and the team, and all those conversations kind of like they they kind of have to gestate into a physical you know instrumentation. Um, and then this kind of view is, I don't know if I can do this. Oh no, it's not doing it. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's a lot of technical information, but, um, you know, you kind of get used to doing it. <laughs> so again, but this is like looking from, from above, looking down, like at the grid. So this is like, you know, if I took the ceiling off the theater and I was looking down, you know, um, it's, uh, I think it's helpful, mm -hmm. it's helpful for them to, them to know. I feel like there's a question. Michelle, do you have oh, yeah. a question? Yeah. I do have a question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course. So before you start this grid, do you know what, how many of what type of lights this yes. place has? Okay. Yes, absolutely. The theater provides um, a, like just like a word document that says we have 100 of these, we have 10 of these, and we can plug in 300 of these, right? So there's, there's always a limitation of how many things you can put in the air. Do you, sure. ever, do you ever ask them to get a hold of a special thing that you really want or? All the time, all the time. Cause it's okay. uh, depending on the show, usually shows will have budget so they can, you know, I think for, you know, which we have a pretty good budget. I don't remember the number, um, but it's like, oh, I actually need more of this or I need this specific light to do, you know, to do this or like, you know, then that becomes a conversation. Okay. For sure. For good, sure. thank you. Yeah. And you have to like keep yourself oh, yeah, within the limitations of what's given to you, but there's always room to kind of like expand out of that. That's a great question. So my question, my question yeah. is for both Jen and Caitlin, and that yeah. is, uh, Jen, you referred to the fact that, of course, it's a collaborative process, and part mm -hmm. of the input may come from the director. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the plan for which, how much of this uh, met, Caitlin, your thoughts, your ideas you know, talk a little bit about this specific production and Caitlin, your feelings as directors and then how those were translated into the lighting plan. Oh, oh that's, that's interesting. Oh, that's, that's, that's such a good question. What's interesting about the relationship between a lighting designer and a director, especially first time, is that you really don't know what the lighting is going to look like until you tech because lighting is, is such a weird thing, you know, with a scene, like a scenic model, you can show the scenic model, 
you can show costume renderings, you can have someone listen to sound, but for lighting, you really don't know what it looks like until you get into the room. So you start turning things on. So um, I would say there's a lot of trust that happens between both the lighting designer and the, and the director. Um, this is why we always have so many conversations because like um, if Caitlin says, you know, I'm gonna need something center or I'm gonna stage something in this corner, you know, I will take that idea and I will, you know, integrate that into the lighting plan. But really the, the lighting designer and the director do not know what it's gonna look like until we start teching. I mean, I have some inclination just because of, you know, you know, uh, from previous shows and, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. But really, I, I'm not really seeing it until everyone sees it for the first time, which is scary, but exciting. Yeah. And I would echo that, like, Al, if you, if, if, if hidden in that question was the idea that I know I can look at a light plot and know what lights would look like on stage, I, I cannot. And as Jen pointed out, like, a scenic rendering, I can be like, that counter is four feet high, or that building does not have a roof to it. But like as a director, and I don't think I'm alone, I think most directors are like, True. I could not look at a light plot and understand what it meant about how. Yeah, things... this is the first time Caitlin's seen the light plot. Uh -huh. <laughs> so like, so typically I do not talk to directors or show them the light plot. I don't tell them like, oh, I'm going to have channel 21 from this side and channel 22 from that side. I don't, I don't talk to them in a technical way. I often will talk to them in a way of like, you know, does this play take, does this scene take place at sunset? You know, does it take place, is it warm? Is it like an Italian, like Riviera sunset? Or is it like sunset in New York City? And those things are very different, <laughs> right? Jen, have so you done a, which before? Have I done which before? I have not. Very few people have done which before. This is, a, a bunch of folks are about to start doing it, but it's only had two or three professional productions to date. Yeah. We're probably gonna be like number three or four. Which is very exciting. Which is very exciting. Those yeah. are such good. Those are such good questions. Um, yeah. I will move on from this and go back. Ooh, to our wait, community. pause for one yeah. second, Jen. Yeah. Tom, do you have a question that's relevant that, about the light plot situation? Yes. Yeah. I, what What effect has technology? I mean, I know in the theater it's almost all LEDs, and you got numbers there like five hundred watts. You're not putting five hundred watts of it, power through an LED. That's true. Um, the technology in terms of like lighting equipment has, has um, enabled, to, there's a lot more choices, right? So before the days of like, this is kind of like a history lesson, sorry. Um, before like all this technology, you know, lights were either on or off and they were one color, right? But now with these like moving lights and these LEDs, lights can be any color you want. They can, you know, they can be anywhere on stage. So now you've, it's almost slowed down the process too in the moment. So you've had, you instead of making one decision, now you have to make 10 decisions times, you know, however many like lights you have. So there's a lot more, um, I wouldn't say it's made lighting designers lazy. I, I think there's just a lot more, um, I mean, I shouldn't say that, yeah. But there's just a lot more decisions that need to be made. Yeah, there's a lot more decisions that need to be made in the moment. So, but I, I noticed you used the term gel, which was old, filters mm -hmm. and I assume you just use RGB to produce the effect of gel or do you actually use gel light still? We still do. Yep. We still do. Why? Why? Yeah. Uh, well, if you look at, if you've ever seen the quality of light from a gel versus the quality of light from LED, they're very different. I like to say like quality from a gel, if I'm being lit from a gel, the light kind of envelops you like all around your face, it looks very natural. It's also like mm -hmm. what we as humans are wired to understand sunlight and incandescent light. Our mm -hmm. brains are not wired to process like LED. So when you look at an LED light, it almost like smacks you in the face. <laughs> it doesn't envelop you. It's hard to explain, but you can definitely tell when you look at an LED, it almost looks plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very hard for audiences um, for a lot of people to look at that quality of light for a long period of time, it just looks very unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, and also like it doesn't dim well, um, even mm -hmm. though you can get a lot more color, the quality, it's all about the quality of the color and the light yes. is very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would argue, I would argue that um, 
you know, theater is trying to move towards LEDs, but I think there's a lot of people, including myself, who um, do not want to see that. I mean, I think gels will be around for a, a little bit longer. Well, can't, can't you have a gel with an LED driving it? Uh, that's a different, those are two separate things. Okay. Yeah. But to answer your question, it's, it's made, there's more decisions that need to be made in the moment. Okay. For sure. I'm I'm so fascinated by that because I hadn't thought about, I mean, part of the reason, Tom, to, to like the brass tacks of why we have a lot of traditional mm -hmm. instruments is also because like theater works moved. I hear all of its lighting stock over from the old space and mm -hmm. um, new lights cost money. And so we're not, we're not getting rid of the old lights until That's we have true. new lights to replace them and the money That's to true. pay for them. But yeah. also this yeah. idea, Jen, that like our brains, our, our eye brains have not caught up to the way that LED works is something that I hadn't, hadn't been framed for me in that way before. And it's really interesting. Yeah, it's weird because like when you go through your day, you kind of experience all kind of quality of light, right? Like we're staring at our phones all day. And then like, you know, we go to, you know, drive, drive in the car, hopefully not looking at our phones, and, you know. So we experience different qualities of light every day, but for some reason, when we're in the theater, like when our antenna of like watching a story is extended, um, seeing that quality of light, um, lighting people is like not as visually forgivable as like seeing a phone or like watching, you know, seeing a digital billboard or, you know, whatever, you know, seeing restaurant signs, like neon restaurant signs. Uh, Jennifer, I, I had an opportunity to, to see the filming, if you will, of a TV series 20 mm -hmm. some years ago. And, mm -hmm. and in the contract of, the, of one of the actors uh, was that it had to be done with film and not with digital photography. And it was exactly that kind of difference between the softness you got with film mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. The, the starkness of LED and, it, and, and, and there's a, it's not just in people's imagination. There's some technical reasons that really is true that they are different. Right, and certainly in which, which I hope you'll, you'll all come see is, you know, that idea of playing on like incandescent gel light versus um, LED light, like in this play of which um, I'm, I'm hopefully, you, I'm trying to, <laughs> we'll see if I'm sure it'll work, but using that idea of taking incandescent versus LED and making that tying that to a storytelling element, right? Mm. So. Interesting. Yes. I love how you're, you're afraid, like light, light is not neutral. Light is not neutral. It's always moving or, you know, it's never static, but um, no, because of wit, you know, because which takes place in a very Jacobean world, like old, older world, like where everything's lit by lamps, like kerosene lamps. And then we eventually get to a point in the play where kind of things have, transported us. Um, so one of the ways that lighting can help us in that world is through color and also quality of light through like potentially LED sources and other types of sources. Um, so those are really, that's really exciting when you get to do that kind of stuff for a play. Jen, had you anticipated that the lighting plot part of this sharing would be the most in-depth discussion? No. <laughs> um, uh, I'll jump back to the other part of the, the slide. Love it. Unless you have Please do. Other no, let's, what happens after this? What could possibly be more exciting? So These are such good questions. I love it. Um, sorry. So I'm jumping back to this. Uh, this is the, the plot for the chair. So we're jumping back to the chairs. So this is just another version of, so you saw that witch plot. This is this basically the exact same thing, just in a different configuration because, you know, this theater is a square instead of, you know, in the round. Um, and then you, you know, this is kind of like the boring part. This is like all paper, this is all the paperwork. So this is like, you know, this is the kind of Excel document you have to give to the, the theater. So, you know, there's, you have the channel, it, it's like where it's plugged into, what it does, the color. So this is all kind of, you know, this is all like necessary paperwork that comes from the, the lighting plot um, that I give to the people to hang the, the, the show. Um, this is kind of, these are, this is actually images of the actual set. So you can kind of see um, on the right hand image where this gentleman in the, the red. Um, so all of where he's standing all the way upstage is actually the audience. So we actually tech the show without putting the audience in just because it was much easier. But you can see in the far, uh, on the far side of the image, those, that's the fly rail. 
and all those lights above, um, you know, I had to spec, I had to tell like which, what height they were, we had a chandelier, so those were the really fun. So the audience and the, the action take place on stage, which is very different. Uh, and you can kind of see in the left image, there's a kind of like a work light situation. Um, but that was our set with the deck and the water and these, these, um, these slats. But you can see like all the lights above, above that. Um, then there's a point that you have to like point the light. So it's what's called focus. So you have to take all those lights that you drafted on the plot um, with all the channels and you have to essentially point them and focus them to like what, you know, to the set. And that can take like, you know, I think the longest focus I ever did was like, you know, over two days was like 18 hours. Because if you have like 300 lights, it takes a lot of time to focus those lights. And sometimes when you focus, um, you're like, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> like how I planned it. So I need to move or I need to change that light from the plan. So the plan is like a starting point. It should be like almost like final, but there have certainly been times when I have done things where um, in my head, I, it sounded good and it looked good, but then, you know, when we did it in tech, it didn't look good. So there's always, you know, there's always a flexibility in that world. Um, so this is actually that, you know, the image, this is like our pre-show image. So you can kind of see like, um, now we have audience and you can see the trash and then the, the chandelier. Um, but again, like everyone's on, on stage. So the, the back row is at the, you know, where the back wall of the theater is. And then, um, again, because this theater is so weird, you know, we don't put people out in the house, like where you would normally put people. <laughs> so that provides a challenge for, for lighting. Cause now you're, um, you have to provide house lights and you have to provide the stage light. And, you know, this, this space was very long and very short. So um, just finding places to hide lights was, um, was a challenge. Um, these are production photos. So this is like, again, this is like, you know, you can see we have lights behind the slats and you can see the chandelier and these like two people, you know, the two old, the, the man and the woman, old man, old woman. Um, and then we had chairs and a Victrola, um, but you can see like the lighting is kind of like coming through these flats and, you know, creating this kind of theatrical world. Yeah. I feel like, Jen, I, I, I am holding your research imagery in my brain as I look at this and the way that you had those photos of what happens with lighting through sort of slatted architecture oh, yeah, yeah. or broken architecture. Um, I feel like I'm seeing yeah. that in action <laughs> here. Oh, cool. Oh, good. Because you can yeah. say to a director, like, hey, light through slats, that will be cool, right? But then if you just show the director, like, an image that inspires you, um, that says so much more, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that that image that you're thinking of definitely came through in this. And I, I do remember, like, hearing this show and thinking about that. Um, this is another image. So this is like, uh, I don't remember what part of the play, but like this is, you know, light not coming through the slats. This is, I think this is like when everybody arrived. So like the lighting was a little bit different, but you can see, you know, on the bottom of the image, we have this like trash idea um, come through and those green walls. So like, you know, and the slats were very kind of like weathered. Um, this is another image of just like light coming through those slats. This is like the first image of the show. Very like Monet, like very like, you know, painting, I can't remember the name of the painter, uh, but, you know, establishing from the very beginning that light in this world comes from these slats and lights these two people in this world. And because it was an absurdist play, we could kind of be a little bit theatrical, like go to this place. So go from like a theatrical color world to something more natural and then kind of more painterly, more kind of um, uh, realistic in a way. And again, this was this was an image of um, you know having again like light coming through the space through these through this doorway. Um, this was like at the very end of the play. But again, those lights coming through slats and through doors because this space was so long. You know, having light come into the space through the diagonal really emphasized you know that that angle for the audience, um, just because of one the architecture of the set, but also just because of the, the limitations of where to put lights in the theater. So sometimes limitations of a space can actually inspire where to put lights and inspire things. So for which, because everything's in the round, um, 
uh, and everyone kind of wants to see the same thing most of the time, all the way around. Um, and because the dusty loo has you know different levels, like vertically, where you can hang lights, um, that can become a storytelling thing of like, what does it mean when lights come from above versus lights coming from below versus lights coming from you know the middle ground? If that makes sense. So like, where the light comes from also has a um, impact on storytelling. Um, again, another image of, of, you know, this is like, I can't remember what part of the image was, but um, the whole idea of this is that because they're isolated on this like island, like everything behind them is kind of in shadow. So we kind of get this sense that we are with them in this intimate space that changes. Um, and again, the trash, I just love the trash. It was really fun. <laughs> I think we all got like fast food one day and we just like dumped the trash into the water. <laughs> um, this was all, this is also, uh, this was like at the end of the play, like this is like when the orator came in. It's hard to tell, but you can kind of see the person on the right side of the image has this like LED collar. Um, and it actually said like just like random text. Um, but in this moment, it felt right because it was so fantastical to expose the grid. So for the entire time of the play, you know, we don't, I mean, we, we don't really see the grid and the lights, but you know, in that moment, we just lit the disco ball with a bunch of haze. And so now the space that we thought was so contained um, on an island now became this vast, like we extended the verticalness of the space um, because that's the, only, that's the only way we could go. Um, and it actually worked in that moment. And then like once the scene settled, we kind of came back down into a smaller space. But um, again, inspired by um, the play, but also inspired by the fact that, um, you know, really the only way you could, you know, the limitations of putting the audience on stage and only in having so much vertical space, um, you know, we, we tried to tie that to something in the story. And I thought it worked pretty good. It was like a, it was like thirty sec. It was like ten seconds of the play, <laughs> so that was kind of fun. Oh, and then which you know, I can show some. Do you want me to? Does anyone have any questions about that? I can show some images, like research images of which. I'm seeing some nods. Yeah, cool. to talk about which. The Witch by Jan Silverman. Oh my gosh, this play. If you haven't read this play, it is an amazing play, but it's also a play that frustrates me so much because. So much about this play is um, about like the question that Jen Silverman is posing to us in this play is if you had the opportunity to essentially um, restart your life or burn everything down, would you? Or like if you had, if you could take revenge on people who have wronged you, would you? Um, and there's this balance of like, there's also like this undertone of like how um, <laughs> in this period, like in this Jacobean period, um, women were not really respected and like how like the language in the play takes that idea and like reemphasizes that even today like a lot of these ideas hold true uh, and it's super frustrating but um, it's such a fascinating play of taking the idea of people and humanity and like the idea of at the end of your life like what do you do like how do you take stock but placing it in this Jacobean period where society, the people in the society are very restricted, like to their class and to their gender as well. Um, so that's always an interesting thing to do. So um, these are just some images I uh, looked at. So a lot of um, kind of, uh, we kind of landed on this idea of like, uh, Kaylin, correct me if I'm wrong, because it feels so long ago we talked about our initial meeting was like- Yeah, it was like a whole month ago. It was yeah. ancient history. I, a lot has happened since then. Yeah, the interesting thing about this play is that, you know, it takes place in these, you know, Jack and Bean, like realistic locations, but then there's like characters speak out to the audience, um, almost like in, they're called arias. Um, and it's the moment in which the characters speak their truth and in which the audience gets to listen in on these characters. So I kind of started to think about, okay, what does that mean from a lighting perspective if, we're, if the audience gets to see these people in their truth? So just thinking about isolation of light, you know, color. Um, I think the, the image on the right, you know, thinking about like a lantern, like does light come from lanterns and candles in this world? Um, 
this is another image just thinking about um, texture and like color like is this a world in which the color of the light is deeply saturated or is it very restricted in color palette um, and how do you thread this idea of like incandescent light into like led more modern kind of light because the play is like the play takes us on that journey like we start from a very like um kind of almost like there's a, there's a beautiful mundanity in the time period too so how do we go from that into these moments of arias where people are speaking their truth into the end of the play i won't spoil it for anybody but you know the very end of the end of the play is very the language is very modern um so how do we go from that like time period jacobean lit by candlelight into something that's more modern and potentially not lit by incandescent sources. Um, again, looking at this idea of like uh, installation, greenery, like I think one of the things we wanted to integrate into our set was the idea of, you know, you know, real materials like real dirt, real rocks. Um, but then also the, the middle image just looking at, okay, the candles give such a warm incandescent quality. And then just thinking about, you know, just, you know, a lot of these images are not, well, I wouldn't say that. some of these images, these are only some of the research images, but some, you know, lighting research doesn't necessarily have to be lighting specific. It can be anything. It doesn't have to have, like, it doesn't need to be super clear like this. It could be like this image on the right of this woman in flower petals, like that doesn't communicate a lighting idea as much as maybe the middle image. But um, I think what's important to me in, in research is like having an emotional response and quality. Um, if that makes sense. <laughs> like anything Absolutely. can spark, spark that. So it, like, are we literally gonna like do what's in the image? Probably not, but you know, I, I think that's the, the tricky balance of research is that, um, you know, cause lighting is such a, you know, it's an untangible thing that you can't grasp physically. Um, so you kind of really have to kind of communicate through other images and um, just yeah. really talk about the play. And especially talk about like in lighting design collaboration, talk about what part of the image, like what draws us about yeah. an image, because I've definitely had an experience. And I think with lighting designers where it's like, we've looked at the same image and both agree that it, something about it felt right to the piece. But unless we talk about it, we might be someone might be talking in this image that you have up for a second literally about candlelight whereas someone else might be really interested on the reflect of in the reflection of the candles on the floor mm -hmm. and like the way that the space um you know feels like it reflects back on itself because of the way that the candles bounce off the floor and if you're just like this picture feels right then one might find oneself in tech with different understandings as opposed to saying the thing that really draws me yeah. about this image is both the quality of the candlelight and how I'm seeing some of I'm seeing some of the portraits and that feels like the quality of light on humans that we'll want. Yeah, rarely ever, I mean, I don't think ever like has a director been like, why doesn't that look like the research image? <laughs> like because that research image was created in a context that doesn't exist for us right now. So you kind of have to be like, you have to preface that sometimes with directors and like, this is the emotional quality. Like, let's talk about, it's basically what you said, like, what about this image is, is resonating? Like, we're not literally gonna do that because <laughs> you can't. So um, that's always the fun part about lighting. <laughs> um, cool, a lot of information. So much, I'm gonna pause this for a second because I like had other questions that I said I might ask you Jen but they also oh, yeah, go ahead. they might be well they might be tangent so I'm gonna like pause and see whether the team in the room do we have things that this has called up for us that we want to hear more about or are wondering about the lighting in my office space is constantly shifting because it's on a <laughs> timer if I don't move often enough it turns off on me oh that's funny since folks are still sitting and thinking for a second, I have a question that like it, it, it is a complete tangent from what we have discussed, but okay. sort of is, is, is um, what I thought I'd ask and, and comes back circles back to the beginning of you mentioning that Colorado might be like your 23rd state or this. Oh, sure. Sure. I'm just interested in, um, 
the I- itinerant nature of freelance design. And I know, I know during COVID, like that has looked very different, but like in pre pandemic times or in the times that we emerge into, what does it look like in your, in your, in your life as a person to be, a, do you do a lot of work on the road? Do you travel? How do you, what does that look and feel like for you? Oh, there's kind of, that's such a good question. Um, I feel like I'm always constantly redefining that for myself because there's always like the, the work part, but there's also like the personal part. Um, I would say, well, I'll start from the personal part because that's always the hardest for me to define. <laughs> Um, for, uh, so, so I live in New York city, um, which is, you know, a huge city, like full of so much theater, but I, I, I've started to work out of town more, but from a personally, you know, I, I don't, what that really means like being a freelance designer, like traveling is that I don't get to see my family that often. So because they're in California and I live in New York, um, I don't get to see them that often. So I'm always relegated to like FaceTime calls and phone calls, um, and I tend to try to only, I, I mean, I see friends in the city, but it's very difficult to see friends because all my friends are theater friends. <laughs> so trying to have like a social life is very difficult when you're traveling all the time. Uh, and it's, you know, you start to miss family, especially around the holidays. But, um, you know, you know, that's when I basically take my vacations is during the holidays. Um, but like the day to day from a work perspective, uh, it, it kind of varies. It really depends on if I'm in tech or if I'm not in tech, if I'm not in tech, I'm usually in meetings, usually in rehearsals, or I'm drafting lighting plans for shows. There's always, it seems like there's always deadlines approaching. So you have to, I have to make time to sit down at my computer and do the lighting plans. And oftentimes I'm not working on one lighting plan. I'm working on like three or four (laughs) that are all due at different times. Um, But when I'm in tech, um, all my time and energy is focused on doing that show. So oftentimes my emails will go unanswered. (laughs) Um, But I mean, I really enjoy traveling. It's, It's fun to, you know, go to different places and meet people and like find a local coffee shop or a museum and like spend my money to like help local businesses and get to make some theater. I think it's really exciting. Um, Yeah, I like pre-pandemic, you know, I feel like I was always gone. So like I, you know, still paying rent in my, on my apartment, but um, yeah, I mean, you can't, you know, you can't see people if you're not physically in town. So I think that that becomes one of the hardest things to do, but you know, you always try to find a balance. Yeah. Do you have any, do you have like, I'm, I'm interested, like last year we had, and this is, this is, you don't have to, but like, um, we had one director visiting from out of town who was like, mm-hmm. my ritual is that I always bring a really nice bathrobe with me. And then whatever the housing is like, I have a really nice bathrobe and I can feel at home in my really nice oh. bathrobe. Oh. Do you have anything that helps you feel like, like any small or ritual thing that you do that makes you feel like a person when you're? Oh, travel? An artist on the road? I I don't think so. I mean, I tried to pack lightly, (laughs) Um, but I don't know. I feel like I don't, I feel like I should, but I don't think I do. (laughs) You could try the bathrobe if you want. I could try the bathrobe. I I hear it. I could try the the bathrobe for which. (laughs) We'll check in about it. We'll check in about whether or not it it did the thing for you. (laughs) Ah, team. Uh, Bo, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you were like, I thought we were going to talk about? What do we think? I am for Witch. Yeah. I'm really excited. I'm- Again, I've got a question quickly for both Ooh. Jen and Caitlin. And oh, yeah, yeah. Forgive me if I missed this in the introduction somehow, but how how is it that we connected with, with Jen? Um, did you know her work and feel like it was particularly apropos for this show, or how did that come about in terms of the process? Oh, yeah. Do you remember? remember? I I think I have an idea. (laughs) Well, I know that the person who connected us is Katie Walsh, Catherine Walsh, who is um, because she and Jen have worked together um, Mm -hmm. in in Michigan. And um, and Katie and I have a in addition to me admiring Katie's work and trusting her judgment, we also have a very similar um, way that our work flows in real life and like a way that it transitions and moves. So I'm always excited for, um, especially lighting designers that are interested in like how the work moves. 
So I trusted Katie's recommendation, but like, but we didn't originally talk about which. No, we connected. Well, so this is a, this is actually another really good point is like, how do you get jobs? Um, and oftentimes like the way that I, so the way that I got which was because I, it's so funny, I can trace every show, every person I met back to like my very first show in New York, it's all connected, right? So like I met Katie Walsh just on a whim um, and I, I did a show with her in Michigan. I guess she liked that work and liked me that she recommended me to Caitlin. Um, so, so for me, from I, I was just doing what I was doing, like lighting the show the best I could and like, you know, in, you know out of town. And then like two years later, this opportunity came, came up. But Caitlin and I had been talking for, I think, couple months like trying mm -hmm. to do other stuff but then it never worked out so yeah we I originally I had sent Jen yeah I had sent Jen other scripts for the season that never was I think oh, that's right. um and so I sent Jen a bunch of things and we talked about those but yeah I mean Kayla and I the initial connection was not direct it was through a, a mutual friend who I had worked with um so, and, and I, would, I would say that's very typical, like of how I get connected to new people and get work is like, oh, I saw your show at Long Wharf. I thought it was great. I think you should work on my show that is in Canada or something, you know? I would say it helps that Jen has an awesome website so that oh, one can true. really take that's in her work. True. And I dropped it in the chat in case after our time together, anyone is like, I wanna see more of Jen's work. Um, that really helps because then I can, if Katie is like, this person is awesome, I can go to their website and just see, because it's not just about like value judgment of is someone good or is someone not good? It's also like, what is their aesthetic? What kind of work are they drawn to? Like, how do they tell story? And like, and you know, as Jen said earlier, you can't tell everything from photos because so much of it is about like uh, how, the, you know, is over time, but you can, you can kind of, yeah, tell, I mean, a lot. Yeah, I would say if you ever get hired, like at least when I get hired by a director for the first time, there's a lot of like, like I assume they like they, you know, even if they haven't met me, they they seen some of my work either in person or they they know from the photos that I can light a show. Um, but again, it comes back. I think half the job is like getting the other person to trust you and also like um, being nice, <laughs> like. It's, I mean, you have to be talented too and like have intuition, but like, I, I think all of that, like, it's not secondary, it's tangential to the idea that you need to be a good person and you also need to be flexible and understanding, have empathy uh, and also just, just be a good person to be around and to trust. Like, it's so funny because I say all these things and like Kayla and I have never met in person. So <laughs> when we meet in person, it's going to be like, oh my God, like, it feels like, <laughs> It I, it's like, true. I feel like I have like we're I feel like we're fifth grade pen pals. I know exactly. <laughs> like we spent a lot of time in these non in person spaces yeah. so that we know each other. But then when we meet, for sure. we'll see. Yeah. So, Quickly about your Zoom background, Jen. What does that yeah. supposed to tell us about you? I love it. That, that was oh, what I, I just go ahead. Just like Edward Hopper paintings. Yeah. I feel like I, I, lighting also, designers like Edward Hopper paintings. I'm also, I also really like small town America because I, I don't know, there's something about it. So I don't know. I just been using this, this one and I, I just like the, the color of the sky. Because mm -hmm. my normal, my background right now, it's just a white wall. So I was like, I need to put some color behind me. Jen, I, I was wondering in your education, do the, is there a lot of discussion of uh, Da Vinci? who is really into lighting and paint. Oh, I mean, a little bit, but not really a lot. Okay. Yeah. It's not necessarily part of the, like, the curriculum is more about like, hey, let's talk about painters who use light and like, we can focus on Da Vinci, but there's not like anything like mm -hmm. super, you know, mm -hmm. like dedicated to that. But I mean, yeah, you can certainly infer like all those things like from painters, right? Like back then, like, how can they do all that like with just paints and color because i mean really lighting is all i mean lighting is an l like is like a like scientifically it's like photons right but really like lighting is all about color like color is light so when you think about that it's kind of interesting yeah 
I feel like I really saw that in those last images that in those images that you were showing of that show, the chairs, oh, the yeah. way that the space and was completely transformed by the light through your use of color. Absolutely. Yeah, the other thing I love to say is that like, um, like I would say like 99% of humanity is unaware of lighting, just like how it affects us, not just in the theater, just in, in our day to day. Like 99% of humanity is unaware of how, is aware, unaware of the lighting of what it is doing to us every day, but everybody, 100% of humanity is affected by it. So even people who don't understand lighting from a technical perspective, um, they are absolutely affected by it. So um, there's definitely a different mood that we have when it's sunny versus when it's overcast. Uh, and like overcast, I always love overcast days because like you can't tell what time of day it is because there's no shadows. <laughs> So that's always a fun thing to think about. Like you wake up, it's like, what time is it? You don't know. We, we, we tell time by, you know, the sun. Um, and when it's cloudy, our reference of the sun and shadows and color go away. So we really don't know. But that's maybe that's just a nerdy observation I make. <laughs> it's true. I, I find it's true, at least for me. Team, I'm going to cut us off. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing the bartender flipping the lights off saying it's time to go home, everybody, because clearly there's so much we could talk about. And maybe we can convince Jen that um, one of the things she wants to do for those of you who can make it to the salon on the 9th is come to the salon and do a little bit of a little bit more chatty chat chat about which. Um, oh, yeah. Let me know. Yeah. I'm yeah. It's literally on the lawn adjacent to the theater. So you might. You might be able oh, to like when I'm it. in Colorado Springs. When you're in Colorado Springs, sure. Oh, we we'll get tacos. See. I love tacos. <laughs> we get tacos. We can see whether tacos are possible. So like whatever the best thing to get, the best thing to eat in Colorado Springs, we'll get those. Okay. Well, this is a sep yeah separate question. Um, <laughs> and if anyone on on this call wants to drop me via email recommendations for. Um, delicious food that Jen should not miss during her short time in here. Um, we will happily take it because we do have a, a list of, of places to go and things to eat that we provide to folks when they're visiting the spring and it, it might need updating in this post pandemic world. And if, um, there's any, if there's any other questions that come yeah. up after we sign off, feel free to email Caitlin and I can respond to them. Oh, that's so generous of you. Thank you. I Jen. always... <laughs> Whenever I hang up from a Zoom call, I was like, oh, I should have asked that question, or I should have mm -hmm. said this, so. Yeah, the out the Zoom door. Out the Zoom door, but yeah, so, yeah, I mean, feel free to, you know, y'all can reach out to me through my email or through Caitlin and be like, what do you think about this? Um, and I hope all of you, I hope I'll get to meet most of you, you know, or, you know, get to see you at the opening. Mm -hmm. Yes, we would love it if every... I hope I hope this has excited you all as much for coming to see which as it has continued to excite me to get to work on it starting next week. <sighs> Bo, would you do you want to wrap up? So I I'm just going to say thanks, of course, to Jen um, for sharing for so me. much, so so juicy, so much, and thank you, of course, to Bo and Bailey and the Advancement folks for organizing this, and all you lovely director circle members for making the work that we do possible yes i it's it's so it's so important to have folks um like you supporting the arts and it, it allows designers like me to to express ourselves and make our art make you know you know make a living <laughs> and dedicate dedicate my career and my life to making art and creating and telling the story so so thank you so much I would just echo that and hope to see everybody on September. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.